Okay, so hi, uh, my name is Karen Johnston, I am Kerry Uye Johnston Iche, and I'm calling from Dakwakata Haines Junction today, and my guest today is Marilyn. Marilyn, please introduce yourself. Good morning. Gunashish, Yadelton Yilhat Duasalk, Dakluwedi Ayahat. My name is Marilyn Jensen, that's my English name, and my Klinket name is Yadel Tin. My Tagish name is Tudisglesia. I'm from the Carcross Tagish First Nation, and I belong to the Duckleweedy clan, which is Killer Whale Crest. And I uh, live in Whitehorse right now. Um, and this is, uh, I'm in the territory, traditional territory of the uh, Tagish Kwan and Southern Toshone and the modern day political nations of the Ta'an Kwichin Council and Kwan Dun. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much for joining me today. So could you tell us a little bit about who you are as an entrepreneur, what it is that you do? Absolutely. So um, early on in my career, I have an undergraduate degree in anthropology. And um, one of the things that happened was uh, we realized, I realized there wasn't a lot of gigs happening within that field. And this was back in the 90s. You know, I just graduated with my undergraduate. So I came back to the Yukon and I worked for a council free fund for nation. First Nations um, for a few years doing a, a elders documentation program. But then my one of my colleagues finished her master's in anthropology and that's Ingrid Johnson from Teslin. And we decided, hey, you know, like let's come together and try to do some work together, you know, and kind of in this field, kind of in the heritage realm. So we started consulting back in the 90s and I was just like a little pip squeak in my 20s and Ingrid was way younger too and we just went for it, you know. So we were two Indigenous women that started a consulting firm called Legend Seekers. And, you know, we were, we're strictly heritage. We're really focused on culture and that's what we're gonna do. And the very first thing that happened was Yukon government last sued us in and got us working on the Yukon First Nation culture and land claims and self-government and all of that workshop, which we've literally been doing for over 20 years now. We've been teaching Yukon government this workshop. So, so there's that part of my entrepreneurship. And, and then um, the other part is the Daka Kwan Dancers, which is, is more kind of a uh, nonprofit, but we do, you know, we do charge for our performances, which we reinvest back into our dance group. And then the most recent part is um, another consulting firm that I uh, work with called Social Innovation Consulting. And so my, myself and my colleague, Thomas Shepard, who is somebody that I met 10 years ago at Carcross Tagish First Nation, and, um, and we developed the Lateral Kindness Workshop, which we've been doing for about seven years and literally is just exploded, you know, uh, across the Yukon, across British Columbia, Alberta, and all over Canada, actually. So I have a lot of good things to say about COVID in that, in that part. So... So my entrepreneurship is kind of, you know, it's been a long, long process um, and started, you know, quite a while back. Could you just explain a little bit more what you mean by lateral kindness? Sure. Oh, so um, I also teach at the university, Yukon University, and I was full time for about seven years teaching in indig the Indigenous Governance program. And now I teach occasionally. Um, and so... Um, lateral kindness is a response in a movement to counter lateral violence, indigenous lateral violence, which is a really um, like predominant dynamic that exists in indigenous community. So it's emotional violence and it's not fun and it's not cool, but it's really, really um, you know, prevalent in Indigenous communities. So I was actually asked by one of the nations, Kwanandan actually, uh, to come in and teach their nation. So their leadership, all of their citizens, all of their staff, everybody else about lateral violence and what we can do about it to change it. So I said, okay, but can I have like, can I bring in my colleague Thomas? And they were like, sure, whatever, whatever you want. And so we started this thing and, you know, really uh, lateral kindness is kind of a, um, you know, a way of saying we're reclaiming back who we really are as indigenous people, which is kind and noble and beautiful and strong and, you know, lifting each other because lateral violence is quite the opposite of that. 
So it's, uh, it's this really great work that I get to do and it's so much fun and it's so empowering and it's really, really, it doesn't feel like work. It's just been amazing. Mm, that's, a, that's beautiful. Um, so what are you learning about your business model over the last couple of months as we've been sort of working our way through this pandemic? Well, Definitely, I think number one thing is how to be flexible, you know, and earlier you mentioned pivot and from what I understand, it's like you got to figure out how do we, you know, how do we work with this, you know, how do we go with the flow and figure this thing out. So for, you know, so for my, for uh, Dr. Kwan, we've done some virtual performances. Um, we've had to kind of readjust and kind of go into development mode. Um, you know, we were obviously not able to dance and do all the things that we usually do. And for the consulting, uh, especially specifically for um, the lateral kindness workshops, uh, first, we just didn't, they just weren't happening, you know. So the very number one thing I had to learn about was you need to have some savings <laughs> for t when times get rough, you know what I mean? Uh, you have to have a plan B. And I know, unfortunately, a lot of people who are newly in business and, you know, are just kind of on a wing and a prayer don't have that. So thankfully, you know, I had a little, little bit in the nest because we just completely stopped. You know, we were just, we were going like full on just crazy busy. And then they just stopped because we couldn't meet, you know? And so basically eventually that evolved into, we started doing our workshops over zoom which is a huge adjustment as well, because so much of, you know, uh, having a good workshop is engagement and, you know, being able to really, um, you know, interact and all of that. So we've had to learn how to adjust and do this over Zoom, which we have successfully been able to do, which is amazing. You know, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, they are, they are definitely better in person, but we've managed to figure out how to do it over Zoom. And so, so there's that. And then eventually we were able to open up to smaller workshops with just 10 people, six feet apart, you know, uh, following the rules, sanitizing and, and uh, you know, not touching the same microphone and things like that. So it's just been an, an adjustment, you know, to following the safety rules and, and just figuring out how can we do this and keep doing it because people still want it. The demand is still there. You know, like every day I get an email saying, hi, this is so-and-so and I'm in Nova Scotia. How can we do this, vid this workshop with you? You know, so it's kind of provided like an opportunity to, to be able to reach far, far further reach, you know, through Zoom and give us the experience and the, the challenge of figuring out how to do that. Yeah, it is this funny thing of like learning how to like really try to find out how to actually connect with each other and people who are you're working with through these like online portals and be able to read body language and read those things that are so important in delivering like when we're teaching people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. The one good thing is when I taught at, um, it was formerly Yukon College, um, my classrooms were uh, half in person. So people were actually in the classroom. And then the other half were people chiming in from all over the place. So the one good thing is I had a little bit of experience in, you know, trying to engage and inspire people, you know, like through distance. Yeah, I feel um, fortunate too, working at the university or the college campus here in Dakota and like just learning how to teach food safety in an online environment when you've got students in Old Crow and Teslin and Beaver Creek and all over the place. And, you know, it was awkward and hard, but I'm really grateful for those lessons now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. What are you learning about yourself as a teacher in these Zoom environments? Um, let's see, I guess, you know, always, always my challenge is patience with technology. Um, I mean, I'm pretty good. I'm, you know, adapting and I can, you know, just jump on and figure things out. But it's always kind of been my, you know, my, my difficulty and challenge. But, um, you know, I really, um, I'm thankful for the challenge, these challenges, because they help you grow and learn, right, and develop and become and have more skills. So, um, um, you know, it's just keeping up with the technology and sometimes things go wrong, you know, like sometimes the Zoom just 
ends and or you're off or you, you know someone doesn't know that they need to put themselves on mute and there's all sorts of background noise stuff like that so um but it's just you know adjusting and and trying to be patient and just go with it and so then what are you learning about like your customers the people you're working with well, I think uh, the, the thing that's great about them is that they're just as willing to be adventurous and, you know, and, to, and just to jump in and try new things as well. You know, like, yeah, let's try this on Zoom. Yeah, let's try it just to 10 people only or eight people because including you two, it's 10 people workshop, you know. So um, I, I'm seeing a lot of, like, I guess you would just call it courage, you know, people who are just willing to try things and put themselves out there and we'll see if this fails or not, you know, which I think takes a lot of trust. Right. So people are quite vulnerable these days, you know? Um, and, and of course there's, we have fear, you know, like I've never experienced in my lifetime a pandemic of this, you know, this size uh, and neither of my parents, right? Like the last one, this huge was a hundred years ago. Uh, you know, like a, a pandemic worldwide where so many people are, um, you know, there's so, I mean, it's just scary. You know, we're, we're doing things that we've never had to do before, like walk around with masks and things like that. So I really, um, I'm really, I think, um, very, very inspired by people's courage, you know, to just keep trying and to just keep going. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's beautiful. What are you learning about leadership? And you can speak to it either in yourself or what you're seeing around you. Um, I think in a lot of cases, I've really valued leadership in regards to people leading by example. You know, so if I, if, you know, if I, say for an example, um, you know, a person who is in a, a chief role, if I want the citizens to wear a mask, then I'm going to too. You know, um, I, I think we've seen a lot of, I'm not going to name names or countries, but we've seen a lot of examples of how not to lead in a, and through a uh, pandemic. But, you know, here kind of like closer to home, um, I think that we've seen a lot of, you know, um, I'm, I'm here, I'm right in here in it with you and I'm going to do what I'm saying. And I think that's probably one of the most powerful expressions of leadership that can exist regardless of what level, you know, of, of leader uh, you, that you're at, you know, so um, I know with, with our, with our, our dance group, Dr. Kwan, it's really important for me that we, that we keep safe and that we are following the, the guidelines, you know, and that we're doing what we're supposed to do because that's really quite a big part of our identity and our mantra is that we're following our protocols. We're doing, you know, um, what we're, what we're supposed to do. So we've been really careful, you know, we have practices and we um, put ourselves, we're outside, first of all, and um, rain or shine. And, you know, we, uh, we make sure that we're six feet apart. And, and when I'm taking pictures and stuff, I'm like, um, everybody, make sure you're six feet apart because we're, we're posting this and we're, we're an example. And some people are like, well, we're in the same bubble to different families. I'm like, well, you know, people don't know that. So you still need to be six feet apart because we want to lead by example, you know, that we're, we're doing things in a safe way. And we're, you know, we're thinking about our elders and other people who are, you know, very vulnerable. And as the pandemic goes on, we're realizing pretty much everybody's vulnerable in this, you know, it doesn't matter. Like everybody is uh, susceptible to getting really, really sick from it. So yeah, I think leadership is, most expressed in the most powerful way through example. So you, you mentioned there are sort of these guidelines that Yukoners have to kind of keep us safe. Um, and one of the big ones for us all we're talking about is this like practicing the safe six, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, maintaining your family bubble, a tight knit sort of circle and washing our hands and staying home when we're sick and don't gather in big groups like you're just saying your dance group is always dancing outside rain or shine like that's amazing I'm so powerful to hear that you're continuing to do that work and even though it's like awkward or not not the way it normally is right um, and you know limiting our travel to rural Yukon communities and and also isolating if we're uh, if we've traveled outside to, to something like an outsider jurisdiction. So which mm -hmm. one of those are you finding the most challenging to 
to bring into your life. Like they're pretty radically different ways of being. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the most challenging part on kind of all levels of my, my life would be the, you know, limiting the uh, number of people that we're with. I know it's, you know, slowly opening up to more, but um, you know, like not being able to be in a group of more than 10 um, inside, you know, is obviously that definitely impacts the business that I do, you know, uh, which usually is workshops with like 20 or 30 people. And then the dancing too, um, you know, for, for Daka Kwan, uh, we've really, really, really felt the loss of not having Attica, of not having, you know, a celebration in Juno, of not going to move the Moosehide gathering. These are all a part of our kind of like our biannual and annual uh, cycles that really feed our feed us feed our spirits you know feed us physically feed us spiritually feed us emotionally all, in all ways you know and so just not being able to do that to to be together you know and and to see our people i mean we do but it's not the same you know and just being not able to dance like i'll you know i'll, I'll just use it the attica example that has been a, like a huge integral part of our life for 10 years right and it's it's a place where we've really really grown and blossomed as you know as a group as a, co a cohesive group and really you know um if, if someone watched us for the last 10 years they really would have seen the evolution of our you know our process and our development and our you know and and how we've just gotten stronger and um you know more confident in, in what we do and just not having that like uh, i I'm really, at, here we are at the end of the summer, I'm really feeling it. And I know the group is too, you know, we, we actually just did a, um, a photo shoot uh, for Indigenous Tourism Canada. Um, and uh, so we were dancing out, out in Carcross, um, but not like a regular performance. It was stop and go and, you know, and lots of talking because they were like still photography. And I was like, my voice is so weak. Um, you know, like I, I'm like, uh, breathing harder, dancing and singing. And so I realized, and I, you know, I've also gained some weight through the pandemic and I'm all like, what the heck, you know? And, and I realized like dancing is such a huge part of my physical fitness, you know, like it's drumming, dancing and singing all at once and just going so hard, you know, often is a huge part of, you know, like my physical regime. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, it's, I think that's been the hardest part is not being able to gather in big groups. Yeah, I, I sure miss seeing you guys too. Like all that love and joy that you bring in the expression of dance, like you, you gift that to us and it's as the audience members, right? To receive it and I miss receiving, and I miss receiving it. Yeah, it's, it's just such a beautiful, wonderful thing, you know, and I, and I, and we just need it. Like our people need it. We need joy, you know, and we need good, we need good things. And so, and, you know, I'm sure all of the other dance groups are feeling it, you know, and all the other, um, you know, people who express themselves in music or, you know, whatever it is, the way that they, that they're able to, have feel joy and bring joy are really, really missing it. So again, you know, I was so thankful that many people are figuring out <laughs> like sing their music over zoom and, you know, have virtual concerts and things like that, which is really wonderful, you know, and we, we did a couple of videos as well. One for black lives matter and another one for like the makeup brush challenge, <laughs> but it just gives us a chance to put like, you know, our, our regalia on and to be able to, you know, sing and stuff like that. So it's good. Mm -hmm. That kind of uh, like goes into my next question, which is sort of how you're thinking about your business differently. So, you know, if these rules, these guidelines are kind of their way of being for the next year, we've got to still keep adapting and having the courage to find new ways of building that community. So our, you know, what are you curious about? that way well i think um it, you know it, it just continues on to um find ways to be innovative right and to and to have the i think the energy to keep riding this wave you know because here we are how many months later you know five six months later and who 
you know what, at the beginning, we're like, okay, by May, we should be able to, you know, and then by, and now we're just like, we're not going to be able to do anything until really there's a, you know, um, a vaccine. You know, I don't know. I have no idea, you know, what, what the future looks like. But I think the hardest thing right now at this moment is conjuring up the energy to keep going, you know, to keep per persevering. Um, I know there's this very real thing called pandemic, um, you know, uh, what is it? Um, people are just getting, starting to get haphazard because they're exhausted. Yeah, COVID um, fatigue. COVID fatigue, exactly, that's what it's called. People are ex getting exhausted emotionally and they're just kind of throwing um, safety to the wind. And it, this is like an actual psychological thing of pandemics that they've seen before. And so we, you know, like we have to like really, really um, strive and find the energy to just keep strong with that, you know, to keep going with that. And, um, and, uh, and, and a part of that I think is, you know, um, coming together, you know, maybe in smaller groups and figuring out how do we, you know, how do we just keep this energy going? How do I, you know, um, find a way to, to keep, you know, making the dance group meet every two weeks and have a practice and to keep encouraging us to like, hey guys, let's develop, let's figure out our new songs and let's, you know, carve those masks and things like that. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity but at the same time, I feel like we somehow we need kind of like lift, you know, a burst of energy to keep going. Yeah, where, where are you finding your wellness? when you're looking, when you're feeling depleted or what, like, how are you kind of keeping your, your life as much as you can in balance, knowing how, how hard it is right now to do? Lots of sleep. <laughs> um, I'm really, really fighting, you know, to uh, eat well, you know, and for me, um, my, my biggest struggle is sugar. So I'm, I'm really trying not to eat sugar. Um, and I like fight for my exercise, you know, I absolutely need to, uh, work out, you know, and, and being outside, I think is a, a, the summer I've really found, um, you know, all the opportunities that I've had to go out on the land to be re even more, um, you know, um, lifting than usual, because I, I think I'm more aware, you know, I'm more aware of, um, just the beauty and the sounds and, and the, um, you know, how that connection or, you know, our deep, deeply rooted and spiritual connection to the land and the animals and just, you know, our traditional way of life is really, really healing and important, you know, so I'm more aware of that. So there's just those things, you know, and, and um, taking the time, I think, to, um, you know, have discussions and talks, you know, and, and trying to connect because I mean, previously that was not a problem, you know, being able to connect with people and get together and, you know, and, and now it's, um, you know, we really have to make special measure to actually see people, you know, and come together and figure out how, how can we do that in a way that's safe. Yeah, come together, but stay apart, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, as teachers, we're, we're always talking about, you know, life, lifelong learning and, and growing our skills. So what's something that you're learning or, you know, have you picked up a new skill or are curious about something? Let's see. Well, here's a cool thing. Um, very few people know this about me, but I am also a visual artist, but I just don't do it that much because I'm too busy. Right. So in my, you know, in my uh, past, I've, I actually uh, did a minor in art, fine art, and my thing was printmaking, right? So, and painting. Um, and then as we started dancing, um, I started doing a little bit of beading, you know, just because of necessity. And, um, but during the pandemic, I picked up the beads and just created like a whole collection of um, things, you know, that I've made through the pandemic just because I've had time and really, really found like just such joy in that. And um, so my thing is, is that I, like I don't do commissions and I don't really sell anything, but I'm making special things as it comes to me for specific people because I want 
those people close to me, like my, my sister and my daughter and people around me to have something special for me, right? To have something very unique and special that was created for them for a specific reason. Like for an example, you just finished your, your you know, undergraduate degree and I'm really proud of you. And so here's some earrings that I made and I made them special for you because you, I feel when I see you, I think you're of a rose and, you know, so I, I tell them exactly what it's all about and why and why I made it and how I designed it and all of that. And a part of that is, you know, because I have some time, but the other thing is, you know, I lost my mom just over two years ago. And um, everywhere I went, you know, people will say to me, oh, your mother was just, she was just one of the kindest people I ever met. And she did this or she did that. And she drove up to Pali to come pick me up because I got this job. And, you know, and just all of these beautiful, sweet stories that people are sharing. And I realized, like, if you're going to leave a legacy, what a beautiful legacy, you know, is that people remember you because you were kind and you, you, you know, you, you did something special. So kind of in that place in my life. And I, and I just thought, you know, I don't want to be to you know, like sell things. I want to be so I can give things to people and that they will always have this, you know, and hopefully it'll become like an heirloom that they can pass on, you know, to their children and grandchildren. So yeah, that's kind of, it's not really a new skill, but it's definitely, I've been able to, you know, uh, work at it more and get better at it because I wasn't a very good beater. <laughs> well, I certainly you've been posting some pictures of them on uh, online and I've loved seeing them. And that, that, that really just is that joyful expression of, of love and kindness. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any advice for emerging entrepreneurs right now? Yeah, I think it's one of the things that's really important is partnership and collaboration. Um, you know, as you're stronger with, with more, I think. Um, and, you know, say for an example, if you and I decided we wanted to collab, collab on something and, um, but I didn't know how to do something that you did and vice versa, you know, we become stronger as a team and we, we're, we're, we're more open, you know, to be able to adjust and do more things, you know? So as I think partnership is a huge, 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 um, strength and benefit you know in people who are starting off like you're never completely alone there's always somebody that can help you and there's always somebody that you can help as well so thinking of that too have you had any sort of like major aha moments over the last little while like the where your way of thinking about something has kind of really shifted in a pretty radical way? Um, let's see. I think, and this, is, this might sound a little bit weird. So kind of where I think it comes for, it comes with appreciating myself more which is weird. I know that sounds kind of weird, but just acknowledging myself because most people are always so hard on themselves. Oh man, I suck. You know, I, I could do better. I'm not that, you know, I'm not that good or I, I'm not good enough. And those kinds of thoughts can be really overpowering to a lot of people, especially when you're in business, because you know, when you're, when you're out there, you're, you're quite vulnerable. You're putting yourself out there. You may have quit a job, you know, with a lot of security or whatever it is, you know, um, and you're just out there, you're out there in the world. So it's scary. It's, it could be a scary place. And I think sometimes it's easy for people to really, you know, like not hold themselves up far enough and to acknowledge, you know, what they're really, what they're doing and how hard it is. You know, and, and so I think for myself, I've really come to this place to acknowledge that, um, you know, that I do do good work and, you know, and I've contributed a lot to community, you know, and, and I never think of these things myself because I, I feel as Indigenous people, we tend to really, you know, kind of self-lateral violence ourselves where we're, you know, that inner dialogue is negative. You know, our self-talk is sometimes bad, you know, and not lifting because, you know, we've, we've heard that a lot, you know, through our lives, through the school system or whatever else, you know, like that really, um, 
uh, you know, resonated message through the assimilation, you know, uh, process in Canada. Basically, the, the core of that is you're bad. You're bad because of the very, your very existence, you're bad. You know, so I think for a lot of, um, you know, uh, specifically speaking of, about Indigenous people, we carry that deeply, you know. So, so sometimes it's hard for me to really see what other people can see, you know, and, and you know, I really kind of thank, you know, like my, some of my business partners because they helped me realize that, especially Thomas, you know, like Thomas, Thomas is um, where we've come from completely different worlds. He grew up in, you know, Ottawa and I call his parents' house, the Peter Pan house, you know, and uh, just completely different worlds. And like, sometimes he reminds me of, you know, this is what you're bringing, girl, you know, like, don't forget that, you know, and you, you're, you're, you know, your gifts are amazing. So, so I think it's that, which is, and it sounds kind of weird, but that's kind of what I, you know, come to realize through this. I don't think that sounds weird at all, Marilyn. I think, <laughs> I think and I think that links back to what you were saying uh, when we began our conversation today about courage. Yes. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those two things, they really go hand in hand is, yeah. you know, the courage to put yourself out there, to speak honestly, to, to be joyful. Right. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you're, that's, that's a big part of it. So thank yeah. you for that. You're um, any songs or podcasts or books or things that are kind of like your jam and getting you through these days? Well, one of the um, people that um, we really kind of, uh, noticed through our, you know, our journey of researching for what lateral violence is and, you know, and all of that and kind of trying to make sense of it is Brene Brown. And, um, and she actually, uh, as I'm sure you're probably well aware, um, she has like the third most watched TED talk ever. And, you know, she's a social worker from Texas that just started researching what people think about vulnerability and all of that. And so, so, um, you know, this word courage in her, in her TED talk, she said, courage breaks down to, um, meaning you have, you have no fear and revealing yourself fully. So telling your story fully is like the true root of the word courage. And so that means tremendous vulnerability, right. Of being able to just put yourself out there. And so I, I really, um, I love, hearing that and listening to her stuff she has on Netflix and on YouTube, but also reading a little bit more about, you know, what she means by that. So I think, um, you know, a big part of this, this whole journey of, you know, the pandemic has definitely taught us about vulnerability and really trying to welcome it more, you know, so, so I love that concept is that I'm, you know, I'm not, not definitely not perfect because a big part of lateral kindness is being able to say um i'm not perfect and sometimes i don't know what i'm doing and i don't and, I, and i'm not afraid to tell you that because in a really high you know lateral violet zone it would be like i don't know what i'm doing and there's no way on god's green earth i will ever admit that to you because you will you're gonna hurt me if I, if you think i don't know how to do something you know so it's like that com complete reversal and Anyway, I love I love Brene Brown's work and you know and and what she has to share in the world. Highly recommend it to anybody, especially those in business, because you're definitely in a vulnerable place here. <laughs> totally, uh, it, it's it's definitely come up a couple times on the podcast series. So it it okay. sounds like the Yukon is reading Brene Brown, which I think is <laughs> amazing uh, because it it will it will you know help us live in that courage that we we so. You Connors, I think we, that's where we want to be. I think yeah, we are yeah. a courageous people who live here. And I think it's time for us to really lean into that courage. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, any final thoughts before I let you go today, before we end up the, the conversation? Just thank you for this opportunity. I really enjoy sharing and speaking and talking. That's one of, that's one of my things too of my business is that I am, um, you know, I'm really trying to do a lot more um, kind of official speaking engagements. Um, I signed on with Speakers Bureau of Canada a couple of years ago. And so it's, uh, it's, it's been, you know, one of my things that I, I really like to do. So it just gives me practice and, you know, a chance to connect with people. So thank you for that. And good luck to everybody. Don't give up. 
<laughs> keep going, keep fighting, you know, and, and uh, just find that strength and courage within yourself and seek other people too for, you know, um, upliftment and connection. Well, thanks, Marilyn. Thanks so much for your time today. I'm really grateful that you spent the time with me today. Yeah, thank you too. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.